It's my pleasure to be able to uh, uh, welcome Matteo Sessia, who is a new faculty member at the Marshall School of Business. Uh, he's um, got an in he came to us from Stanford Department of Statistics, um, which is where he got involved in, uh, in, in genetics and that he's going to talk to us about today. Um, before that, Sestio, you're going to, I mean, Matteo, you're going to have to remind me about what you were doing in Italy, but oh, yes. your physics incarnation, as I understand it. Um, yes, so uh, that's what I did before statistics. I, I studied physics in Italy. Uh, at, where was that? Uh, Politecnico di Torino, so that would be in the Northwest. Uh -huh. So, uh, tech, tech engineering school. So um, it appears that his interests overlap quite strongly with our statistical genetics group. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a, a more relaxed uh, sit down with him after we get our, um, the renewal of our program project grant submitted uh, for a discussion about our common interests and areas for potential collaboration. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Matteo, now uh, to talk about um, knockoffs, a concept that we have heard about at one previous seminar uh, about a year ago before the lockdown. Um, and I could certainly use some uh, a refresher. Looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, everyone, for, for letting me intrude in this, in this workshop. I've actually really enjoyed uh, the, the previous two meetings, and, and I plan to keep attending. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my PhD work today. Uh, this is something that I just finished working on very recently and the last paper in fact is still is, is still a preprint. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor from Stanford Emmanuel Candice as well as with Yara Sabatti who's also a professor at Stanford and other collaborators that were students at the time Stephen and Eugene and Jonathan Marchini from Regenera Pharmaceuticals. So I'm, I'm a statistician, so I'm also going to talk about the statistics and, and probably the genetics part doesn't need much motivation in, with this audience. But um, just, just to, uh, to give a little bit of background, I'm interested here in developing statistical methods for the analysis of GWAS data. And I'm particularly interested in the analysis of complex phenotypes. So uh, it could be blood pressure, diabetes, anything with, with a lot of possible explanatory variants. My goal is to find which of these variants uh, affect the phenotype. And just to introduce the notation, I'm going to denote the phenotype as Y, and, and I have N observations of it for, for N individuals. And I'm going to denote the genotypes by X, and I'm going to treat them as numbers between 0 and 2, and I have P of them for each individual. The phenotype may be other continuous or binary. So, so it could be a quantitative trait or a case control study. And the whole method that I'll describe is really uh, agnostic about the, the phenotype. So the phenotype could take any values and it could depend in, ar in arbitrary ways on the genotypes. I I'm not gonna really wonder, I'm not really gonna, gonna worry about how Y depends on X. I'm just interested in finding out which variants, which, which variables in X affect it. And, um, I was very interested to, to learn about all the different kinds of data that, that you're thinking about now. So maybe GWAS seems a little old fashioned with this audience, but it's still interesting, I think, because we have very large data sets now. And this paper was published two years ago. Uh, it was an analysis of the UK biobank data, which involves also almost half a million individuals. And there are other very large GWAS studies that are being conducted now, which are leading to the discovery of, of thousands of new associations. So here's a plot that I took from this paper uh, from, from Nature Genetics two years ago. And they're just showing how their new statistical method that is based on mixed effects models is leading to a lot of new discoveries compared to, to, compared to what you get from uh, linear regression analysis. And, and, and this huge number of discoveries is really enabled by the large sample size of the UK biobank. So obviously finding associations between genotypes and phenotypes is not fully satisfactory in itself, what we would like to find out, what geneticists would like to find out is really which variants are causal. We would like to find variants that have a biological effect on the phenotype. 
And, and everyone knows that the association doesn't imply causation. There are many reasons why a variant may be associated with a phenotype, even if it's not actually involved in any biological mechanisms that regulate it. And one reason is that the variants are not independent of each other. So that, that's what geneticists would call linkage disequilibrium. You could have a variant that is associated with a phenotype just because it is dependent on some other variant that is a causal variant. And part of this dependency is due to the physical proximity of the variants on, on the genome and, and their inherited together. So they tend to co-occur in, in certain patterns. But there are even bigger patterns that can be seen due to population structure. Uh, individuals may be stratified in the population. You, you may have individuals that are more closely related to within a certain group as opposed to, to the rest of the population. You could, the, the most extreme example is when you have individuals of different ethnicities or a mixed individuals of, of more than one ethnicity. And this, this causes extra correlation between the variants and, and extra spurious associations, which is a well-known thing. So when, when you apply a linear mixed model to, uh, to a GWAS data, the results the, uh, look something like this in this plot. So this is an analysis of uh, a playlist count, if I remember correctly, uh, using uh, 350,000 individuals in the UK biobank. And I focus on a relatively small segment of a chromosome, and I'm showing the association p-values on a negative log scale with that phenotype. So each dot corresponds to, this is just a zoomed in Manhattan plot. So each point corresponds to a p-value for a particular variant. And the p-value is above, above the dashed line, which, which you can barely see, it's, about, it's at the height of 7.3. That corresponds to the Bonferroni threshold for significance, five times 10 to the minus eight. So anything above that is statistically significant. But you can see that the, uh, these discoveries are, tend to occur together. And that's because these variants are associated with each other. And so if one is significant, those around it are also significant. And my question is, how do I tell which of these associations correspond to distinct discoveries? How many, how many different uh, variants are there here that have distinct effects as opposed, as opposed to just what I see with, as opposed to just marginal correlations? How many distinct signals are there here? And there are heuristic ways of doing this just by trying to, to group together uh, the p-values for SNPs that are uh, similar to each other. And, and, and the results of, of one of these clumping algorithms, the standard one that is implemented in P-Link are shown here. So the, the, the dots in, different, in a certain color correspond to P-values that belong to the same clump. And the segments below just indicate the span of those clumps. And so the first thing you see is that if I just apply the standard algorithm, uh, I get clumps that are, that are very close to each other. They even are overlapping. So it, it's not immediately clear how many associations there are here. How many distinct ones. And there's a whole field of fine mapping that, that tries to sort this out. But today I'm going to discuss it about an alternative method that, that I developed with my collaborators, which tries to take a different approach to the GWAS analysis, tries to analyze the data genome-wide, much in the same, like similarly to, to linear mixed models, but also incorporates this notion of distinctiveness in it, so that the results will be automatically distinct and the associations will automatically denote distinct signals. They will not be measuring marginal associations. So in the statistical language, what I say is that I'm interested in testing conditional hypothesis. I want to test whether Y, the phenotype, is independent of a particular SNP XJ, conditional on all the other SNPs. So that's different from the marginal association because I'm not conditional on all other SNPs, including the SNPs that are in linkage disequilibrium with the SNP of interest. And uh, the, the modeling assumption is that I have pairs of observations of, of genotypes and phenotypes for, for each individual that come from some distribution. And this joint distribution over the genotypes and the phenotypes can be trivially decomposed into a distribution over the genotypes and a conditional distribution of the phenotype given the genotypes. So my object of interest is to find out something about how P of Y given X depends on X. In particular, I would like to find a subset of the variables in X that is sufficient to explain the variation in the phenotype. So I'd like to find a subset S star that, uh, that, that conditional on, 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 that, on the subset, the phenotype is independent of all the other genotypes. I wanna find the, the, the smallest subset of genotypes that is sufficient to explain the variation in the phenotype. And if, if you allow me to, to, to be a little uh, relaxed with, with this terminology, I'm gonna say that I'm looking for causal variables. 
And I'm going to denote a variable as causal if the conditional hypothesis that I wrote about is not is is not true. So so the conditional uh, the, the SNPs for which this conditional dependence holds are the SNPs that I will call the null ones, and and the others will be the causal ones for the purpose of this talk. They may not necessarily be the biological causal ones, but but they should be reasonable proxies for this. And, and we can talk more about, about why they're not exactly the same. And this should look very familiar if we make some extra assumptions about the distribution of y given x, which I will not make, but it's just for uh, explanatory purposes here. If you think about a linear model for y given x, just a classical multiple regression model, all we're asking really is, are the coefficients for, for this particular, is the coefficient for this particular SNP equal to zero or not? And, and, and this hypothesis just becomes the usual hypothesis that you would test with a t-test in linear regression. And, and the same is true for uh, generalized linear models. But, but we'll, we'll keep the non-parametric approach uh, in, with this method. So it will be more general. Uh, since I have uh, many SNPs to test simultaneously, I'm interested in, uh, in control. I have to adjust for the multiple comparisons. And while the traditional approach is to control the family-wise error rate, that is the probability of making a single false discovery, which is why people use a Bonferroni threshold. Since uh, uh, I'm interested in studying uh, complex phenotypes and I expect to make thousands of discoveries when I work with large data sets, I don't care that much about making a single false discovery. I'm interested in controlling the proportion of discoveries that are false. So I will be trying to control the false discovery rate, the expected proportion of false discoveries. Um, the I, conditional hypotheses are quite ambitious to test at the single SNP level. I may not be able to tell exactly which SNPs are likely to be causal, but I may be satisfied with finding a group of SNPs that is likely to contain a causal effect. And so I'm also going to define this more general version of the conditional hypothesis, where for a given partition of the SNPs into distinct groups, I want to test whether the phenotype is independent of the SNPs in a particular group, even all the others. And in the special case where the groups contain one snippage, this, this reduces to the hypothesis that I defined earlier. So this is a preview of the results, which, which should give you a, an intuition of, of, of what the method is trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm looking again at the same uh, Manhattan plot that we had earlier for the analysis of, of plate account at the bottom. And at the top, I have the results uh, obtained with, with, with the method that I'll describe today. And the results are a little different uh, in, in, in the way they're presented, so, but the horizontal axis is the same. It's still there's the physical posi position along the chromosome. On the vertical axis, I have the resolution at which I'm conducting my analysis. That is the groups of SNPs that I'm testing. And the shaded rectangles correspond to a group of SNPs that was discovered by, by the method I'll present today. So if you look at the middle group uh, at the lowest level, that's just a group of SNPs that, that were rejected. So, so that means we, we discovered this group of SNPs, which means that we think there is a causal SNP somewhere in that genomic region. And the, the groups are defined a priori. I, I defined before testing my hypothesis. And I, here I'm just showing the groups that are being discovered. And the groups are nested. So whenever I move up to a higher level of resolution, the groups are always a subset of the groups below them. And when the signal is sufficiently strong, I'm able to find it in multiple levels of resolution. And that's what you see around 112 megabases. That's, that's, a, that's a region that contains multiple signals. And you could already see from the Manhattan plot with the LLM method that there was something there, but it wasn't immediately clear which of the SNPs were, uh, were causal, and you would have needed to do some kind of fine mapping to, to try and sort it out. But this method will do that automatically, and it's doing it genome-wide. So at, in the upper panel, I'm just showing the result on, the entire, on this entire chromosome, uh, in, in, but, but we actually have it across the entire genome. And I, I put this slide here just to reassure you that, that we've also implemented this and you can try if you want, um, because, because people were talking about uh, like how, how important it is for you to develop software and, and make these methods accessible. So I, I completely agree with that. And in, in, my, in my own little project, I, I tried to do the same. So, so we have software and, and there, we also have a Shiny app, which is something that people were talking about that will allow you to explore the results of these analysis interactively. So you can just navigate these plots and zoom in. And, and there's actually a little bit more information in, in the plots that you can get uh, with this app compared to what I showed. 
So here's the plan for today. Uh, I'm going to start giving a. I'm going to start with an overview on knockups of, of what the method is, and, and that that is the basis for for for, for our analysis. Uh, I'll discuss then how knockups uh, can be used in the context of hidden Markov models, which is the assumption that we will make, uh, the, the modeling assumption we will make about genetic data that will allow us to, to apply this to, to this kind of data. And then I'll describe how we implement the method for genetic data and, and how we apply it for the analysis of mutated bioweb genotypes. So just a little bit of background, why do we need uh, knockoffs? So knockoffs are this new technique uh, that comes from statistics and they were developed specifically to, to address the problem of controlling the FDR in regression problems. And controlling the FDR is difficult because uh, if, if we think about the genetics context, the, the GWAS context, it's difficult to control the FDR because uh, it, it, needs the, it needs independent p values. And the problem we have with the, with the LMM approach and, and the reason why, the LM, why, why traditional GWAS don't even try to control the FDR most of the time is that they, these methods produce a marginal association p-value for each SNP, and these p-values are not independent because the SNPs are not independent. And, and so uh, there really isn't a very uh, reliable method for controlling the FDR with this kind of, kind of p-values. And here's a simulation where I just showed that two naive ways of trying to control the FDR with these p-values don't work. So one thing you could do is just relax the significance threshold. Instead of rejecting everything uh, that is below five times 10 to the minus eight, you could try to reject the null hypothesis for p-values that are a little larger. But as soon as you increase that, that threshold a little bit, it's, it's not, your discoveries will no longer control the FDR. And the problem is that these p-values are, are not independent. So here's an example where I just applied the Benjamini Oscar procedure, which is the typical way of calibrating the threshold for FDR control to the p-values computed by uh, by Volta LM on, on the UK Biobank data for a simulated phenotype. And in this panel here, I'm showing the false discovery proportion, the, the proportion of discoveries that are false, as a function of the irritability of the simulated trait. And the method should nominally control it at 10%, but these two naive in, in implementations of, of BH that I consider, which, which are the first things you would do and, and, and things that people have told me that I should try to do, um, they, it just doesn't control it at the nominal level. Uh, I, since I know in the simulation what the ideal threshold should be for FDR control, because I can just count how many false discoveries I get, I can implement an ORC, which will just calibrate this threshold and, and just, it's just an Oracle procedure that will always control the false discovery proportion exactly. I can do it because of the simulation. And when I do that, it turns out that this, obviously the procedure controls the false discovery proportion. It's just these purple triangles, uh, but it's not actually better than our method in terms of power for the resolution of the discoveries. That is, it doesn't make more discoveries and the discoveries are not actually more precise. They don't localize the causal variance any more precisely. So, in, so, so, so from that point of view, our method is doing something non-trivial here. Uh, and, and our method is not using any knowledge that, that we wouldn't have in a real analysis. It is just a preview. Um, so, okay. so. The, there are other difficulties that, that we are interested in addressing. One is that we are interested in measuring conditional association, not marginal association. And so besides the problem of controlling the false discovery rate, we have a problem that we want test statistics that measure conditional association instead of, instead of uh, marginal association. And that's not trivial. If, if the classical approaches for GWAS measure, measure marginal association. So either uh, univariate regression, linear mixed models, or permutations, they will all measure marginal association. Then I said that we have the problem that even if we have uh, p-values for the, the, the whatever p-values we have, we still have the problem that they're not independent and it's not easy to control the FDR if these p-values are not independent. And, and finally, uh, there's uh, the one, one challenge that we're interested in is how do we make GWAS methods more flexible with respect to modeling assumptions? Because the standard methods uh, of, of LLMs and, and, and linear regression assume that the phenotype depends linearly on the genotypes. And that may be reasonable sometimes, but it's actually really hard to verify. And, and there are cases where we know it's not true. If we have a case control study, that, that's definitely not the case. And, and people have shown that, uh, that these methods actually require certain corrections in order to be valid with case control studies, even in, 
even for simple designs. And, and in general, when, where we may have interactions or nonlinear effects, it's really not clear whether these assumptions can be justified. And so I would like to develop a method that is agnostic with respect to that. So knockoffs are, are providing exactly the tool that we need for that. So knockoffs are, are more general, and they're a tool for calibrating test statistics in order to control the FDR. And in particular, they're uh, designed to control the FDR for test statistics that measure variable importance. So here's a simulation where I'm simulating a phenotype, even 1,000 variables. And this is just a simulation. The variables are genetic variables, but, but the phenotype is completely fake. And I'm measuring uh, variable importance by doing sparse linear regression. So I'm applying the lasso to this data, and I'm showing you the absolute value of the regression coefficients that I'm estimating. So these statistics already have the advantage compared to the typical GWSP values that they try to measure conditional association. They're not as affected by, by linkage disequilibrium as, as marginal p-values. But we still have the problem that we don't know uh, how, to, how to determine a threshold for these, for these uh, importance measures in order to control the FDR of our discoveries. Here I'm showing you in different colors the test statistics for the causal variables and the non-causal ones. So it's reassuring to see that at least most of the really large test statistics correspond to causal variables, but, but not all of them. And even though the lasso produces a sparse uh, solution, which means most of the test statistics are actually equal to zero, not all of the test statistics that are different from zero correspond to causal variables. So, so there's a question here of how we calibrate this. Knockoffs uh, give us such a way to calibrate it. And the way they work is that they augment the data with additional variables, one for each of the original variables. And then the test statistics are computed both on the, on the original variables and the knockoffs. The knockoffs by construction behave in the same way as the non-causal variables, which is why, and, and also the knockoffs are by definition non-causal in the sense that I generate them independently of Y just looking at X. So, so they don't have any, and I, and I do that after I already collected Y. So they have no effect on Y whatsoever. So I know that they are not causal, but it's really useful to know that they behave in the same way statistically as the non-causal variables. So when I look at the left plot, normally I'm colorblind. I don't see which variables are causal and which ones are not. But when I look at the variables in the knockoffs simultaneously, I can immediately recognize which variables on the left behave significantly differently from the variables on the right. And I know that the variables on the right are knockoffs. So just by comparing the left plot and the right plot, you can come up with a precise way to determine a significance threshold such that if you reject everything above it, you control the FDR. And intuition here is if you reject things above 0.1, you know that there, there's no knockoffs that go above that. And the knockoffs behave in the same way as the causal variable is the non-causal variables. So you're also fairly confident there are no non-causal variables above 0.1. And that, that's intuition. And this was made precise. And the idea is that you symmetrize the statistics by taking the difference between the test statistic for a variable and its own corresponding knockoff. And this contrast is symmetric for the non-causal variables, which means that it's equally likely to be positive or negative. And it's a coin flip. But it tends to be positive for causal variables. But by construction, the knockoffs are not causal. And so their association with the phenotype tends to be smaller than the association that true causal variables have. And so this basically gives you test statistics that you can work with and, 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 and come up with a mathematical way to control the FDR. And so, and so basically by comparing these two plots, we'll come up with a threshold. And if you reject the original, if, if you discover the original variables about the threshold, you're guaranteed to control the FDR. So here is uh, how knockoffs are implemented into our method for analyzing GWAS data. So here's a preview of, of the method, and then I'll dive a little bit into the technical details of some parts. So we start on the left from the data box. We have a phenotype Y and genotypes X. So the first thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna face the genotypes, reconstruct the face apple types. We're then gonna come up with a probabilistic model of the distribution of the apple types using knowledge from population genetics and the typical models that are used in the field. And we'll use that to generate knockoffs that satisfy the property that I mentioned earlier that they behave in the same way as the, as the original variables. And, and I'll make that precise in a moment. Once I have the knockoffs, I deface them. So, so I get knockoff genotypes and I augment the data. Uh, I, I create a larger 
theta matrix that has twice as many variants now, both the original ones and the, and the knockoffs. And I use that augmented data set to compute my test statistics. And the way I compute my test statistics, since I'm interested in measuring conditional association, is by fitting some kind of predictive model, multivariate predictive model, that, that tries to explain the variation in Y using both the variables and the knockoffs. And from this model, I'll extract some important statistics, like the absolute value of the regression coefficient or something like that. And then I'll calibrate it using the knockoff filter that I described earlier. And, and, that, will, and that will give me my set of discoveries. And I'm going to repeat this, this, this procedure at different levels of resolution. So uh, I will divide the, the genome into different groups. And I will make the groups increasingly precise. And for any particular choice of groups, those groups will be my units of inference. So I will, when, when I will make a uh, discovery, I will discover the entire set of SNPs in, in that particular group. Uh, and, and the choice of, the, of, of these groups affects the way I generate the knockoffs. And the intuition is that when it will be easier to make knockoffs and it will be easier to make discoveries if I have larger groups. Because the question I'm asking is, is just less informative. I'm not precise in identifying the causal variable, I'm just localizing it within a group. So the, the problem will become increasingly difficult as I make the group smaller. So here's how the defined knockoffs, so how knockoffs are defined. Um, you say that uh, you say that X tilde, a random vector X tilde of length P is a knockoff copy of a random vector X if it is independent of Y given X. So that, that goes without saying, I need to make X tilde without looking at the phenotype, and, but, but that's easy to do. The more important property is that the joint distribution of X and X tilde should be invariant if I swap any knockoff with the corresponding variable. So imagine that you have three variables and three knockoffs. If I were to take the second variable and swap it with the second knockoff, the joint distribution should be the same, which means it, it should be indistinguishable. So a special implication of this is that knockoffs should have the same distribution as the original variables. They should look the same. You could do that by simply permuting the original genotypes. However, permuting the genotypes will break some of the symmetry because I'm also asking that the correlation between x1 and x1 between x1 and x2 tilde be the same as the correlation between x1 and x2. And that you can't get with a permutation. So we'll need a much more sophisticated algorithm to satisfy this problem. But this is necessary. This is the main key that allows us to prove FDR control. At the same time, I want to make sure that the knockoffs are not identical to the original genotypes because I could create a trivial knockoff by setting x tilde equal to x. That would satisfy these two properties, but it would lead to a procedure that has no power because in the end, I will make discoveries by contrasting the test statistic for the variables to the test statistics for the knockoffs. If those are the same, there's no contrast and I have no power. And so, the increase, and so you see that this, this, this uh, goal is, is a little bit in contrast with the constraints that I had above. So the constraints that I have above will limit my ability to make X tilde as different as possible from X. And the geometrical intuition here is that if you have two random ve vectors, x1 and x2, and I'm showing them in the space in such a way that their angle is basically proportional to one minus the correlation. So the closer they are to, to each other, the more correlated they are. If I want to make a new knockoff, x1 tilde, it needs to be exchangeable. So it needs to preserve the same angle with x2, but I also want to make it as different as possible from x1. And so one solution is to just make it equal to x1, that, that obviously doesn't achieve my second goal but at least it has the same angle with X2. The other solution is to put it on the other side. So now it's, it's as different as possible from X1, but it still preserves the angle with X2. I can't go farther than that. I can't put it vertically because, because then it won't preserve the angle with X1 anymore. So the next thing that I need to construct knockoffs is a model for the distribution of the genotypes because they are defined based on this, on this property of exchangeability, which, which assumes that I that I have a distribution for the genotypes. And the way that I'm going to model the distribution of the genotypes is using hidden Markov models because that's the standard in, in genetics. And, and unfortunately, they're also computationally amenable, so I'll be able to come up with a practical algorithm to make models. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna talk about this. So, so most, of, most of these uh, HMMs are, are quite similar in spirit and they all originate from the original Sheed and Stevens, uh, sorry, Lee and Stevens description of of linkage disequilibrium through hidden Markov models. But the hidden Markov model that I use in, in the implementation of this method is 
um, is based on the shape it each event, which which is what uh, is is currently the state of the art for phase and imputation. And we developed an algorithm, and I'm not going to dive into the details of this because um, I, I want to talk other things. But we developed an algorithm that is basically a three-stage algorithm that will construct knockoffs for hidden Markov models. And the idea is that we'll start by imputing the latent Markov chain in the hidden Markov model, and then we'll use that to construct a knockoff Markov chain. And then from that, we'll, we'll sample the final knockoff observations. And we're going to do this for every apple type. And, and, and the key ingredient here is really dynamic programming. It's all going to be generalizing ideas from the, from, from the uh, Viterbi algorithm. So, so it's very relevant for, for this. And, and we can do the same for group knockoffs. So I was talking about here about how, how to define knockoff, knockoffs for, um, th these are the knockoffs that we'll use to test the conditional hypothesis of Y independent of XJ, given all the other variables. I will define slightly different knockoffs when I'm interested in testing group level hypothesis for multiple SWIFs, for multiple SNPs. And when, I, when I'm only interested in testing the association of a group of SNPs given all the others, but I'm not interested in distinguishing between different SNPs within the same group, I can relax a little bit of definition of the knockoffs. And this will give me more power. So when, when, I'm, when, when I want to test this group level hypothesis, I only require exchangeability of the knockoffs at the group level. So I will, the constraint is going to be softer. I'm going to require that if I take a group of SNPs and the groups are fixed, if I take any group and I swap it with the corresponding knockoffs, the joint distribution doesn't change. So this is, this is a weaker constraint because I'm restricting the set of swaps that, I, that I'm considering. And this allows me to make knockoffs that are more difficult, more different from the original variables, which will give us more power. And again, we have an algorithm that is, is quite similar and has the same computational complexity to, to, to generate knockoffs that satisfy this group-wise exchangeability. The, the model that, the, the particular form of the hidden Markov model that we use is, um, is, is, is closely inspired by, by the shape of HMM, as I mentioned earlier. And here's the intuition. Suppose we have a data set of haplotypes. And so this is after phasing. And here I, I'm showing six of them. I, so, so the shape of HMM assumes that every haplotype can be modeled as a mosaic of motifs of pieces taken from the haplotypes of the other individuals. So here I'm showing you the mosaic for two haplotypes, for the first two that I, that I showed in black, is a mosaic, an imperfect mosaic of, of pieces of the other haplotypes. So every haplotype will have, uh, will, be, will, be, will be represented as a mosaic of pieces from other haplotypes. And every haplotype will take pieces from a different subset of haplotypes. So here the first haplotype is a mixture of blue and red. And the second one is a mixture of yellow and green. When I construct knockoffs, what I'm going to do basically is that I'm going to shuffle up the colors a little bit in such a way that satisfies all the constraints that, that, that we laid out earlier. And since I'm going to work with very large data sets, uh, I'm not going to consider all haplotypes when I look at that particular mosaic, but each, each individual, each individual haplotype will be described as a mosaic of motifs from K other haplotypes. So there will be a set of K reference individuals. There will, there will be a personalized reference panel for each individual haplotype. And that will characterize the hidden Markov model for that particular haplotype. This is how shift it does it. And, and we, we repurpose this model to generate knockoffs. And the idea is that the reference haplotypes for any particular individual are chosen as those that overall, over the entire genome, are most similar to it. And this is what we will use to try and capture population structure. You may have uh, a collection of haplotypes in different shades of blue. And whenever you want to describe one of them, you mostly describe it as a combination of other blue haplotypes of different shades. But you will not pick many red ones. So that, that is how we will make sure that this model also captures population structure. It will be through the choice of the reference haplotypes. The other thing that we want to capture the other property of this data that we want to capture in the model is the presence of familial relatedness, because that's something that is quite relevant for large studies, such as the UK Biobank, where there are thousands, there, there's uh, over 100,000 individuals that have at least one relative, one close relative in the data set. 
So if I look at the real data, I will see that there are many haplotypes that are identical over long segments. they are long identical by descent segments. And I want my model to capture this. So here I have two apple types, the, the, the black and the gray one, and they're sharing the blue segment. That, that is a long segment that is identical. And we can find identical segments in the data very efficiently. There's, there's plenty of software for that. My goal is to generate knockoffs that satisfy, that respect this, this property. Since they need to be exchangeable at the population level, they also need to preserve the same IDP segments. And, and we can do that, and we can do that by describing the distribution as a generalized in the Markov model. Uh, you can think of it as a Markov random field. It's going to be a higher dimensional distribution because we'll model jointly the distribution of all haplotypes that share IBD segments. And I'm not going to get into the details of this, but I'd be happy to discuss it offline. In any case, with this model that, that builds a little bit up on the shaping model, we can still generate knockoffs and, and they will still satisfy the usual exchangeability properties. So this is how the red part of this method works, which is the part that I'm really going to focus on. Uh, but, but here's the schematic of the entire method again, just to place it into the context of how it works. Once we have the knockoffs, we'll augment the data with them and then we'll compute our test statistics and, and symmetrize them. And uh, we'll repeat this from different partitions of the genome, which is how we will construct the, the plot that we saw earlier with that we saw earlier with, with the discoveries at different levels of resolution. We'll just build it by repeating this procedure layer by layer. And uh, in terms of, of the statistical hypothesis, this layer by layer procedure defines a hierarchy of hypotheses. So at the highest level of resolution, which is actually at the bottom of this plot, we have the single SNP hypothesis. So every uh, node in this tree corresponds to an hypothesis. And at the lowest, at the lowest level, we have the single SNP hypothesis. So each, each node corresponds to a SNP. And then when I partition the genome into larger groups, I have now hypotheses that correspond to a group of SNPs. And there's a strict hierarchy. So um, I, uh, any node is always, so every, every node is always containing exactly one variant. And, our goal will be to test the conditional association hypothesis at each level of resolution while controlling the false discovery rate at the desired target level, let's say 10%, at every level of resolution separately. That, that will be our statistical guarantee in the end. And the statistical guarantee will hold as long as the model that we use to describe the distribution of the genotypes is accurate. So that will actually be our only assumption. If we could prove that the model we have for the distribution of the genotypes is the true model that generated the data, then we would know that the FTR is controlled and, the, and this will be guaranteed in finite samples. So the only approximation here is the, in the distribution of the genotypes, which, which is a very different statistical perspective compared to what we do most of the time, when instead we consider X as fixed and we make some modeling assumptions about the distribution of Y given X. Here's the opposite. We take X as random, we make some assumption about its distribution, but we don't assume anything about how Y depends on X. And I would justify this approach by saying that we know a lot more about the, distrib the distribution of the genotypes because we have models from population genetics, which have already been applied for phasing and imputation, which, and they work really well, whereas we really don't know that much about how Y depends on X because the understanding the genetic architecture of the phenotype is actually what we're trying to do here. So, so we can't assume that we know much about it to begin with. And here's how it works in a simulated example where I can, where I, where I, where I can try to start convincing that, that it has some desirable properties, at least, at least in theory compared to uh, associations by, by mixed effects models. So here I, have, I, I did a simulation with real genotypes in the UK Biobank. I just took 350,000 individuals in the UK Biobank and I generated a fake phenotype for those individuals with, uh, with 2,500 2, uh, causal variables. And I, group, I put them in groups of five. So there's 500 loci with five causal variables each. And here I'm showing you the results on one particular locus that contains causal variables. But I applied both procedures, the knock of zoom, that's, that's how we call the procedure that I'm proposing. And both of them, I apply them to the entire data set, so to the entire genome. And here I'm showing the associations found by the two methods in this particular locus. 
and the causal variables are shown with asterisks in the bottom plot and vertical bars in the upper plot. So they coincide exactly the two plots are aligned. And the, our discoveries are the green rectangles and all of them contain at least one causal variable. And you can see how if I move up to higher resolutions, I can only pick up some of the causal variables, whereas at the lower resolution, I picked up all but one. And similarly, the Walter Lamb here uh, finds a few SNPs that are significant. A couple of them are causal, one or two are not. And P-Link will summarize this into two distinct discoveries just by looking at the LD structure. When I increase the signal strength, I just make a phenotype that has the same architecture but is more heritable. The results change dramatically. So I make more discoveries with both methods, but the Associate, marginal associations spread out. So now my discoveries obtained with P-Link cover a much larger genetic region. They become less precise in a certain sense. And that's because I'm measuring marginal association and marginal association spreads around because of LD. Whereas with the other method, we are making more discoveries at the single SNP resolution. And I can zoom in and I can see I'm actually picking up discoveries at the single SNP level. So this method is not spreading out uh, associations. You see, I'm not finding anything uh, in this area because it contains no causal signals, but both of them is finding stuff here because the R's in the R statistical is significant. It's just that they're marginally associated. And both of them can't really tell us which of these five SNPs are causal, but that our method is, is quite confidently picking them up. So that, that is the method, that is the kind of result that I'd like to see. That's encouraging. And here I have the results of a lot more simulations. Uh, involving the UK Biobank. We, 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 we took hundreds of thousands of individuals and they had two sets of, uh, of simulations, one that only involves British individuals and one that involves all individuals of different ancestries. And for each choice, we simulated Y given some linear model of X and with a certain choice of causal variants and there are a lot more experiments in the papers, this is, this is one particular setup. And then we, we just tested how the methods compare. And the interesting point that is worth emphasizing here is that since the, the, the simulation is quite realistic because even though this phenotype is simulated from, from a simple model that is probably not realistic, our method doesn't assume anything about the model for by given X. The only assumption it makes is that the distribution of the genotypes is accurately described with the hidden Markov model that, that I'm using. And in the simulation, the data are are the real data that I, that I will analyze later. So this assumption is just as accurate here as it is accurate in the real data analysis. And so from, from this point of view, if there is model misspecification, it's being reproduced in the simulation. So if so, the simulation will tell me something about the robustness of this method to the, to the assumptions. And I'm going to compare uh, two different versions of so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go a little faster here because I want to get to the end. But uh, we have two different versions of the method I described. One is is exactly what I said with the shipped HMM. We also have an earlier version that that we described in in, in, a, in a previous paper that uses a simpler HMM that doesn't account for population structure. And I'm gonna summarize the story for you. Uh, what we see is that the method that we are proposing is more powerful than Walter Lem and produces more precise discoveries while controlling the false discovery rate. And in fact, what we see is that this method is actually almost as precise as Walter Lem calibrated by an oracle that allows us to achieve perfect FDR control. And the oracle knows what the causal variables are and basically just uses that knowledge to choose the significant threshold. That's something that is not available to us in practice, but we can do it here as just as a theoretical benchmark. And, and so that, that will basically provide a provide a, um, a way of comparing the power of the two methods. And what we see is that the power is, is comparable in that sense, and it's much higher than what you get from both of them applied in the realistic way uh, with, with a five time, times 10 to the minus eight threshold. Uh, and at the same time, we, we get discoveries that are a little thinner. So if you look at the third plot, that is just the size of our discoveries. That's how wide every, every sink, distinct discovery is. So in, with our method, it's just the size of the, of the groups, which we decided in advance. And with both of them, it's the size of these clumps that are returned by peeling. And the goal here, obviously, is, is to make as many discoveries and to make them as small as possible, because that will localize the causal variance more precisely. 
And what we see is that when you increase the sample size, here's a slightly different setup, the size of our discoveries doesn't change because it's fixed in advance. The power stays high, but what you see is that the size of the discoveries reported by the, by the mixed effects model increases, which is undesirable. It, it means it's spreading out the marginal associations and it's making the results more difficult to interpret. And, and that, that is the same phenomenon we saw earlier, but here is just summarized uh, in, in, in a more systematic way. And here, what I was doing is that I was comparing our discoveries at a particular level of resolution. We see that the resolution is fixed. What I can also do is to compare the results at different levels of resolution and just report the most specific ones that I find. And if you, if you count them in that way, then the discoveries actually get more and more precise as the signal strength increases because, because of what we saw here, that, that stronger signals will allow us to make high resolution discoveries. And here I'm comparing with two fine mapping methods and, and I'm finding that basically the resolution that I can achieve is, is comparable. It's somewhere in between what I get with one and what I get with the other. So it's almost fine mapping precision, but it's acting genome wide and it's more powerful than, than a linear mixed model. So, so that, that is, I'm sorry, the high level summary. Um, here's a different simulation where we're looking at a phenotype that is not linear, is a binary phenotype. It's simulated and it's, simula and it's a simulated case control study. And what you see is that the mixed effects model doesn't control BFDR and doesn't control any error metric. It makes false discoveries. It makes too many false discoveries because the modeling assumptions are not correct. Whereas our method keeps the false discovery rate controlled and is actually more powerful as soon as the signal strength is strong enough because it makes no assumptions about the distribution of Y given X. Uh, I also have simulations involving uh, diverse uh, individuals with diverse ancestries. Here's a simulation with 10,000 individuals divided equally into the six ethnic groups. And here's a PCA plot. And what we're seeing again is that the method controls the FDR even in the presence of such strong population structure. And I'm just going to skip through these. Um, and I want to jump in the, in the remaining 10 minutes to the uh, to a quick summary of the discoveries that we make on real phenotypes. We looked at a subset of the phenotypes measured in the UK Biobank and uh, they're listed here. We have BMI, cardiovascular disease, um, and, and, and platelet count, respiratory disease, blood pressure, and so on. And I'm showing here just the number of discoveries at low resolution. So these are groups that are about 200, about 200 kilo bases wide. So that's a little narrower than the resolution you would get with uh, a mixed effects model here. The, the typical size of the clumps that Peeling would report is about 400 kilo bases. So even if we use a slightly lower resolution, which is a little more ambitious, we still get many more discoveries. And that's because we're able to control the false discovery rate. And here I'm just comparing the number of discoveries, number of distinct discoveries. So I made some attempt with both of them and making these discoveries distinct, even though it's a bit heuristic, but, but I did my best with, with the standard methods. Whereas the discoveries with knockoffs are just distinct by construction. And I'm also comparing how many of our discoveries overlap with the discoveries in both, reported by both LM and vice versa. So both LM, for instance, makes 697 discoveries for BMI Nine, almost 99% of which overlap with ours. So it doesn't really make additional discoveries, very few. And our method makes many additional ones because of our 2,400 almost, only 37% have a correspondence with all the, with all the land. All the others are different loci. side. So that's, that's the kind of information I'm summarizing here. And here is a, um, a summary of, of, the, of how the results of our method change when I analyze different subsets of the individuals. And I'm looking at four different subsets. I'm looking at all individuals, including related ones or excluding related ones, and British only individuals. So I'm trying to remove population structure, either including the closely related ones or, or not including them. And what we can see is that, uh, is, is that by increasing the sample size, which is something that, that we showed with simulations that seems to be safe to do, uh, we can get many more discoveries. And um, 
I know that people in GWAS typically try to stay away from analyzing data with population structure, even though they also have methods to mitigate to mitigate these negative effects, either with mixed effects models or PCA. Our method is specifically designed to account for it. And as far as I could tell through lots of simulations, it, it works. So I feel quite good applying it to this data, including all individuals. And, and that does lead to more discoveries. What you can notice from this plot is that the gain of including related individuals is actually much greater than the gain, the gain you get from including uh, non-British ones. And that's partially due to the fact that we don't have the many non-British individuals in the UK by bank because it, it, it only involves people from the UK. So most of them are ethnically British, but the, there's a lot of them that are related. So we really get a larger sample size, much larger sample size, including the related ones. Uh, we still get a little bit of a boost from other diverse individuals, but I would be really interested in trying to apply this to a more diverse data set to see what happens. And the gain may be bigger here. Uh, we also made uh, some attempts at validating the discoveries, and it turns out that the majority of the new discoveries that we make is actually confirmed by other studies. And that's the last column. So I'm looking at discoveries that we made that are not found by both of them applied to the same data. And I'm counting how many of those I can confirm either by looking at other studies, and I looked at the GWAS catalog, the FinGen resource and the Japan Biobank resource. And then I also did an enrichment analysis using the data in the FinGen and Japan Biobank data set, which are independent of the UK Biobank. And, and with those two methods combined, most of the time, except for plate account, we can actually confirm uh, a fair majority of, of the new discoveries. Here's what the one particular discovery that I cherry picked uh, for this talk looks like. Uh, it's, I'm looking at cardiovascular disease. And just, this is mostly just to give an illustration of what the discoveries look like. Um, I'm looking at a small segment on chromosome five. Uh, there are no uh, discoveries according to both the length here, although you can see there are some p-values that are almost significant, they just don't quite get there. And there's a lot of them, again, because these are correlated. And our method also finds that there's something here with, with the level of confidence that controlling the FDR at 10% gives us. Uh, we're not able to pinpoint exactly which SNP it is, but at the highest resolution, we can, we can narrow it down to this region, which includes uh, four genes. And well, at that point, I mean, that, that's where our theoretical guarantees end. Of course, we could try to guess, we, we could always go back and look at the marginal p-values and we can do lots of things to, to, to try and figure out which SNP is important. But at that point, it's, it's, it's up to, to people with other expertise. So I'm sure that people can do fine mapping at this point. My, my only goal here is to try and do a genome-wide analysis with FDR control. And, and, and if I aim to be, uh, rigorous statistician, this is this this is this block is where I need to stop. But but people who know more about genetics than me could probably could probably tell me a lot more about which of the SNPs is more likely to be causal. And by a quick Google search I found that two of these genes in this region actually are associated with traits that are closely related to cardiovascular disease. So maybe there is something there. And here's another example it's basically the same story but for a different phenotype. And and here we have a little more information because we can actually pinpoint exactly two, three SNPs at, at the single SNP resolution. And, and two of them are missense variants. So, so this is a little more uh, promising. Although I think in this example, both of them was also finding these discoveries. So, so this, is, this is not a novel one. So that was all about this project. Uh, there's other stuff going on in, in, in the Stanford group that I'm involved with. We have a, different version of this, uh, of this method that actually provides much stronger causal inference. And it comes to the cost, it's only applicable if you have trio data, that is if you have parents and children together and it's less powerful, but it gives much stronger causal inference. And, and you can read about it here, it's, it, it's gonna appear soon on OpenAS. And then there are two projects that I'm involved with and, and one that, that is closer to completion is trying to follow up on these discoveries that we make with different populations. And I said that, and just analyze the different populations together here. Uh, I, I'm reporting the results that we got, including all individuals related and non-British also. 
but we could instead ask about what discoveries are seem to be invariant across populations, which discoveries can be independently reproduced in different populations. And there are non-trivial methods that allow us to try to answer these questions. That's something that I'm gonna work on. There's lots of open questions and, and I'd be very happy. I hope this is just the very beginning of, of the conversation with you. Uh, there's computational and statistical questions about extending this method to whole genome sequence data where we have a lot more variables, but we, we gain a lot more information. Uh, there are statistical questions about how we make the method more robust. There are two main shortcomings of this method, which, which I didn't mention until now. One is that there's randomness in it because the knockoffs are random. So if you are to run the method multiple times on the same data, you may get different answers. And every time you know that you're controlling the FDR, so on average, your guarantees are always valid, but the results may not coincide exactly. And and to some people, this is this is not ideal. I mean, it's, it's definitely not ideal to anyone, but um, that's what we have to live with right now. Uh, there's also the problem that the method it really isn't applicable to uh, studies that are either of monogenic diseases or underpowered. So if you expect that you will not make more than a handful of discoveries, this method is not going to work well for you. It needs many discoveries to be powerful and stable. So, Matteo? So, yeah. I have a question regarding that. So, hi, my name is yeah. Nick Mancuso. Oh, this is an excellent talk. A very, very interesting uh, idea. Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts? So, what are your thoughts? This is kind of like a two-part question that's related to that. But what are your thoughts about applying this um, to, let's say, like gene expression data, but genome-wide, right, as a means to boost power to find transQTLs? Um, and so, you know, it's kind of related to, to the issue of power. Um, that you said, you know, you know, there's a lot of evidence suggests most of the signal, uh, regulatory signal for, for gene expression is trans and not local. So signals out there, but you know, how much is still, how many lists are still kind of unclear. Um, and um, separately, you know, if, if we can think about um, doing a march along the genome that, that needs to do these permutations or, or not permutations, but uh, your al run your algorithm, right? Um, if the genome is fixed, right, if you have a fixed number of individuals, but you have like a multivariate outcome, right, so say gene expression across, you know, a, t a ton of genes, right, um, yeah. is there a way for it to, you know, while it's doing this, this uh, simulation, right, to essentially be a faster means to, to account for all of those at the same time, or, so I know those two parts, and, you know, you know choose to, but, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on those. Yeah, so let me ask a clarification because I'm not super familiar with, with gene expression data. Um, is, are the gene expressions the explanatory variables or are they the response variable? Are you the response. To the, those, those are the phenotype. Is, yeah, so, so instead of uh, something like height, okay. yeah, instead of something like height, you can imagine measuring, um, quantifying the expression of a certain gene using some technology, right? Yeah, but I see. for now, just imagine, imagine it's a continuous phenotype, some quantitative trait, uh, and it just happens to be yes. called gene expression. Except you have thousands of them. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. That's... Okay. I see. Yeah. So I think this is doable, but it's an open research question how you should best implement it. It is not something that I thought about, but my my first impression would be that it might be doable. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, I you know, it sounds like you're you know, you've demonstrated the statistics are valid with respect to a single trait, but if you know, how does FDR extend if you want to do like a multi-trait analysis on this procedure? Yes, exactly. Um, so that, that'd, that'd be really cool. I think the first question is, yeah, so I'd be happy to talk more about it. It's, it's not entirely clear to me uh, what would be the hypothesis to test. So then I think the, the first question would be to find that. Um, are, are you interested in finding something that affects a particular gene or like any gene or you see what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah, you know, that, that, that essentially, yeah, it's, it's the same assumptions as GWAS, but now just that the trait has changed the gene expression. Um, but anyways, I, I think I've eaten up enough time, and I'm sure other folks have questions and you want to wrap things up, so uh, we can chat further offline. Yeah, let I me apologize. Uh, I think Eric, I'm really Eric, in the room for questions, but um, I, I'm here, so. Well, uh, let me second Eric's comment that, 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 that was a fantastic talk, and also your own, that let's hope that this is the start of a beautiful friendship. Um, and we have lots more time to uh, discuss these ideas further. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about before um, we go? No, I'm done. This, this was the last slide.
uh, I, I'm just sorry that I that didn't leave room for questions within within the hour. I'm well, some of us have to leave for a one o'clock class. I know Kim has already left, um, but those of you that want to hang in here and continue discussing, um, we, we can leave this uh, this Zoom open for a little while. Any other com questions for uh, Matteo? Yeah. I have a couple of questions, but I don't know if, he, if he's okay staying a little bit over. Uh, oh yeah, I don't have to teach, so I'm, I'm here. Okay, I, I'm Juan Pablo Luinger. Um, so that was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Um, so my questions are sort of first, whether the FDR is controlled within each level of resolution or across the levels of resolution. Yeah, within, within. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I wasn't clear, you mentioned that uh, when, in a when you simulated database on the UK Biobank, uh, it was built in uh, some kind of uh, examination of the robustness to the specification. But yeah. I wasn't clear how that was accomplished. Uh, actually, my, my overall question is whether you had done more analysis to, to evaluate the sensitivity to your assumptions. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we do have, yeah, so th this is a good point, and it, it's something that I, I didn't cover very explicitly, but we do have analysis in, in, in the papers where we show what happens when we assume that the distribution of the axis is something, but it's actually something else. And, and we can show how, how that affects the control of the FDR. Normally, if you don't have the right distribution, you, don't, uh, you may not have the right FDR control, which is why in this case, we want to see what happens with this particular data. So what I meant by saying that we reproduce the model of misspecification is that I am taking the real genotypes in the UK biobank and I'm simulating a phenotype for them. I'm not simulating the genotypes. So my assumption is that the method will control the FDR if the distribution of X is accurate. So the assumption is on the distribution of X. When I, so if it's not true, I should see, uh, so, so if, if I am, if, if, my, if my method is not robust, I should see that I don't control the FDR in the simulations. If I see that I control in the simulations, I'm like more calm, I, I'm more confident than before that it will control it in the real data analysis because the real data analysis is based on the same X. The only difference compared to the simulations is the distribution of Y given X which in the real case, I don't know. But my method doesn't make any assumptions about it. As long as the distribution of X is accurately approximated, the method is valid regardless of Y given X. Great. And um, if I may, can, uh, I, I know maybe I'll wait because there's other people that want to ask questions. Josh, I think you wanted to ask a question. Looks yeah, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, Mateo. Very interesting. I really like these ideas of the, the hierarchical uh, approach. Um, but I, I'm still unsure of why the, a permutation-based approach wouldn't work. Because, I mean, you, you mentioned that you want to preserve the dependencies among the Xs. Yes. And, but if you if you took a more regional approach to the permutation then it, it seems like that would still preserve those dependencies so if you permute if if, if you let, let's let's look at this uh, sorry i want to find the the manhattan plot so or actually sorry let, let me find a manhattan plot for the simulation and, and meanwhile i can start talking so if you if you permute uh, the genotypes, the permuted version will be completely independent of, of the phenotype. But the, this is not, so this is not the same as a non-causal variable in the original data because the non-causal variables in the original data are not necessarily independent of the phenotype. If you look at the simulation here and, and you look at this point, point this point I know for sure is not causal. I generated the data, I know this one is not causal. But you can see that it has a, a statistically significant association with the phenotype, just through LD. 
So this p value is significantly smaller than 10 to the minus eight. If I do a permutation, I'm never gonna see any of the permuted p values larger than this threshold. The threshold is designed in such a way that no permuted p values will ever go above it. And so that's, that's where things break down because now if I assume that my null SNPs behave in the same way as the permuted ones, I am forced to conclude that this one is, 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 is significant. And it's significant in marginal sense, but that's, that's not what I'm ultimately interested in. I'm ultimately interested in saying whether this is a distinct signal or not. And, and the permutation just isn't really informing me about that. The permutation can be used to find a threshold for the statistical significance of marginal associations. That, that is what it, I can do. So in the typical, th this threshold here that, that I'm using uh, is assuming that my, so, so here I already have, the LLM has valid p-values. So it's well calibrated for marginal association and it achieves that through some parametric model. In, in, the, in this mixed effects model that is, that is a linear model with, with Gaussian errors and the Gaussian priors, we can compute exactly values. If we didn't know how to do that, we would use a permutation. But either the LMM, the LMM or the permutation are still doing the same thing here. They're calibrating marginal statistics. I see. Nice. I get it. Well, Pablo, did you have another question? Yeah, I have. Um, so, you, so co computationally, how you know how burdensome or how uh, easy to do is this? So, in theory, the complexity of there are two components. We need to generate the null cost, and then we need to compute the test statistics. To generate the null cost, the, com the complexity is linear in uh, the size of the data. It's linear in NMP, and it's reasonably fast. I implemented this in C++, and I applied it on the UK Biobank data with 500,000 individuals and 600,000 variants, and it takes about one day to generate the null cost. Um, it, it's actually significantly faster than phasing. Uh, we use phase data, so the which we, in the case of the UK Biobank, you, we can just download from, from, the, from the website, but it, it's simpler than phasing. And, and since phasing is done by default, usually, uh, it, it generally knockers will not really be the bottleneck in the grand scheme of things. But it's, it's similar in principle. But many of the computations are, they will remind you, they're different, but they'll remind you of phasing. It's, it's, it's a similar principle. Um, computing the test statistics, is a little more difficult in theory because we have almost absolute freedom regarding how we want to compute them. You could, the, the way I did it is I, I fitted the lasso and I was lucky enough that someone wrote a very fast implementation of the lasso for genetic data just while I was working on this, just in time. And so I, I could fit the lasso thanks to this software in about one day on the UK Biobank data on, on this. Um, 500,000 people and 1.2 million variants because now I have twice as many because of the knockoffs. So, so that's, that's, that can be done in, in, in one day. It will become a problem if you want to do this for full genome sequencing data because, because then, then, then you don't really know how to fit the lasso. So you'll have to compute some other association statistics that, that are cheaper. But, but the method in principle is valid with any association statistics. And my last question is: So, when you when you run the lasso, um, you just include the 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 genotypes and the knockoff genotypes, but you don't include any other adjustment coverage. So, you don't try to adjust for population structure because already the method uh, does it. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I actually do include other variables. I include both some uh, explanatory variables that are independent of the genotypes, like age and 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 and, and uh, sex because they might explain some of the variation in the phenotype and the more variation I can explain the more powerful my statistics will be. I also include some principal components of the genetic data because not, not so much because I need to control for so I do it because I want to account for population structure but not because I needed to control the FDR because that's already 
baked into the knockoffs, but it's still useful because the lasso is trying to build a sparse model, a model with as few variables as possible to predict the phenotypes. If there are differences in the phenotype across populations, across subpopulations, knowing this population structure information will help me explain more of the variance. And the best way to do it within a sparse model is just to include some, some summary of the population structure, like the principal components. So, so that's why I actually do include it in, in the class. Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Well, thank you again, uh, Matteo. And we will definitely want to continue this discussion into the future. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, so, and thanks for the great questions. Thanks for the talk. And bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.